Amen, amen. Let's, let's just read tonight as we start uh, the, uh, we call this abbreviated version because it doesn't have all the wording in it that uh, the Ten Commandments have, but it gets the point across and everything, and we're familiar with them. And uh, let's, let's just look through those. And uh, one through ten, thou shalt have no other gods before me. God speaking there, Je that's Jehovah God. Let's make sure we know that. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill, which is murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And thou shalt not covet. Now, those are just, just the reading of the uh, of the Ten Commandments, and uh, that's uh, we're going to look tonight at some of the things that the Ten Commandments are, and some of the things that the uh, Ten Commandments are not, and uh, and so tonight, um, I believe they're 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 very important. Uh, they're not uh, outdated as as some have some have said. Let me read you a quick thing. This is Ted Turner. I don't know what there is about these guys that get to be billionaires, but uh, they think they're real smart and smarter than you and I, and they can sort of tell us what to do. You know, that's, that's true with, with billionaires and probably millionaires or anybody with a lot of money. Sometimes they're thinking like, you know. And uh, so here's what Ted Turner said years ago. Uh, Ted Turner has declared the Ten Commandments obsolete. He said we're living with outdated rules. The rules we're living are under uh, the Ten Commandments, and I bet nobody here, I don't know who he's talking to, pays much attention to them because they're too old. When Moses went up on the mountain, there was no nuclear weapons. There was no poverty. Where do you get that? <laughs> I mean, there's no nu nuclear weapons except, you know, God you know, could, could do anything he wanted to do, but he said there was no poverty. There's always been poverty anyway. He says, today, the Ten Commandments wouldn't go over. Nobody likes to be commanded. Commandments are out. <laughs> well, Ted, as far as I'm concerned, if you're listening to this, you're out. The commandments are in. <laughs> and so, uh, anyway, uh, I, I'm not being, you know, want to be unkind or anything like that. But listen, uh, don't let this world tell you, you know, if, if God says, uh, you look in here and God says one thing, I don't care who it is, if it's a millionaire or a billionaire or a gazillionaire or somebody down the street, if they tell you something different than what the Word of God says, then you just naturally have to take what the Word of God says. Now, let's start in, uh, with, our, uh, with our paper here, and I think they got it on PowerPoint some. Uh, I don't know. They got, they're having trouble hearing back there. But anyway, this is... Christy, will you sit with him, please? Uh, he's by, by himself. Somebody said he had B.O. We're not sure, but nobody would sit with him. Oh, there's, I forgot you two in the back. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't blame Annalise. All right. So tonight, let's look at the, uh, at the introduction, a little introduction I have to uh, the Ten Commandments. You got them? Thank you, Billy. And uh, they can't, there's something going on the sound system they can't hear. And uh, Brother Joey has, uh, is taking a nap, looks like back there. And no, he's not. <laughs> we love you, Joey <laughs> and Billy. Uh, <clears throat> so, number one, are the Ten Commandments the plan of salvation? And, and the short answer to that is no. <laughs> they are not the plan of salvation. If you, if you uh, strive to keep them or did, you know, could keep them or, or whatever, that's, that's admirable. But uh, there, uh, you could do the best that you could and, 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 and keep, you know, try to keep them and everything, but that would not save you. They are not the plan of salvation. But I, I think one of the best ways to illustrate that is in the, in the verse there in 2 Timothy 3.16. And, and uh, isn't it kind of kind of ironic that we're in the Old Testament and we're talking about the Ten Commandments? 
and the first place I go to is in the New Testament. Are you surprised? No, you're not surprised. But here's, here's what the scripture says uh, there in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's, it's, there's four things. L listen to these things. It is profitable for doctrine, one, reproof, two, correction, three, and then for instruction in righteousness. Now, let's, let's just take, take those, those four things quickly. Uh, all Scripture, in other words, uh, the Old Testament and New Testament, and the Bible tells us here what, the, what this is, is good for. And uh, number one is, is, is doctrine, and we know that that's teaching. And that's simply what God has to say about a, about a matter, you know. It's doctrine. It's, it's the teaching of the Word of God. It's what God says, and it's, it's what He puts out there. Now, tonight we don't have time to look at a, a whole lot of doctrine. There's uh, soteriology, which is the doctrine of salvation. There's, uh, there's pneumatology, which is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. There is uh, Christology, which is the doctrine of Christ. There's theology, which is the doctrine of God, you know. And, and there's all of these teachings and everything. There's angelology. So that would be the doctor, the teaching about what? Angels. There you go. And so there's all of these, these teachings and everything. And, and the Bible has, uh, tells us what it has to say about these things and everything. And so uh, I'll just take one. Uh, l l let's take the subject of creation. I love to think about creation and, and, and God and, 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 and what... Uh, what God has to, to say about creation. God, listen to me, God is real big in the Bible on us knowing that He created all things. And, and you see that over and over and over uh, throughout the Scripture. Uh, God will get going and He'll say, I am the Lord God that made thee. In other words, God is saying, you wouldn't even be here if I hadn't have made this. And so God made us. He, he put us here. And he, he made the heaven and the earth. And, and here, here's, a, here's this one, one good verse. And the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 44 in verse 24. Thus saith the Lord, uh, thy Redeemer, he that formed thee from the womb. Now, you ever think about that? God formed you and he formed you and he formed you. And he formed you, and he formed you. He formed all of us. And, uh, and I look at some of you, and I just want to laugh, you know. <laughs> and y'all want to look at me, and y'all want to laugh, you know. And uh, how many of you remember years ago a, a preacher that was, was, was real famous, is on the scene, he probably still is, uh, but his name was David Ring, and he had cerebral palsy. Y'all remember David Ring? David Ring had a sermon that he preached about, I think he entitled it, God Don't Make No Junk. <laughs> and bless his heart, he, he struggled to preach. You hear him, Randy? He struggled to preach. Sometimes you'd have to listen to him real close because he had cerebral palsy. palsy. But, but uh, in spite of that, he still, in, in spite of his shortcomings, his inabilities or whatever, he still did a great work for God. Years ago, there was a preacher by the name of uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, and Charles Haddon Spurgeon uh, won, uh, was a, a, a famous uh, evangelist from uh, England, and he won thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people to the Lord. And it was always on Charles Haddon Spurgeon about his English. They said, your English, you know, you butcher the king's English and all that. Some guy come up to him one night. He'd heard it to you, sick of it, Clifford. And he'd come up to him one night after and said, you... And, and pointed out the places, the mistakes that he made while he was preaching. And he said, you missed it over here. You missed this over here and everything. And Charles had, his, had Spurgeon. He was a card anyway. He stuck his tongue at him. He said, he said, you see that right there? And stuck his tongue out. He said, I'm using that for the glory of God. What are you using yours for? You know? And so... Uh, so uh, God formed us. He, he made us, as this verse says. And then he goes on to say, and it's a great verse. Uh, you can just write these, some of these verses that aren't on your paper. You can just scribble them down and go back and look at them later. 
And then he says, uh, after he had formed thee from the womb, he says, I am the Lord that makes all things. So that's what he thinks about creation. I made it all. That stretched forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. God said, when I, I made this thing, I didn't need any help. Somebody said, now I didn't say this. Somebody said that's why God made man first. Because he didn't want any, you know, if he'd made woman first, he'd have got some advice on how to make the man. Now, I'm not sure about all that, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, so God says, and, and I love that where it says, I stretch forth the heavens alone. One and I looked at a thing the other night about the, the universe and, and the, the stars and, and the galaxies and, and how it's still expanding and everything. And it looks like, you know, if you can imagine how great God is, that God just kind of took the, the, all these planets and stars and nebulas and everything and just kind of like that right there and just stretched them out. Just like that verse said. When you look at it, you know, from those uh, satellites and Hubble and all those up there, he just stretched forth the heavens alone and spreadeth out the earth by itself. All this stuff we have, the seasons, the, the, the trees, the grass. I love, I love the study of creation, you know. And so that is uh, doctrine is, uh, is, is, is taking those things. All scripture is given by inspiration of God for doctrine. It's for teaching, for all teaching in all these areas. And then uh, for reproof and correction. Now, I will say this about Ted Turner's statement. He, he's probably pretty close to the tr truth there because not very many people like to be reproved or corrected. And listen, uh, God that made us has that right. He has the right through his word and listen, when Brother Joe and I are up preaching or we're teaching or whatever we're doing, and we run across there, and there's a verse over here that says, Thus saith the Lord. And it hits you right between the eyes. Don't get mad at us. God said it, you know. And so uh, the Word of God is for, uh, is for doctrine and it's, and it's for uh, reproof and in its correction and then look at that last thing that second uh, second Timothy 316 says for instruction in righteousness can I tell you that's where we are that's one of the main the four things that scripture is for instruction in righteousness and the Ten Commandments are not the plan of salvation but their instruction in righteousness. How many of you want to be right with God? You want to be right with God? Sure you do. Well, the Ten Commandments are instruction in righteousness for the believers, for people that are, that are saved. And you say, well, they're, they're, they're Old Testament, they're a long time ago, and we'll say some more things about that. And so uh, <clears throat> I, I love that, instruction in righteousness. Now, there's three kinds of laws in the uh, I don't probably have time to get into that too much. There's the moral law, the civil law, and the ceremonial law. And uh, we're, there, there's a lot of things about the ceremonial law that have been fulfilled. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we don't, uh, aren't you glad that we don't have to sacrifice animals when we meet on Sunday? Because Jesus was the supreme sacrifice. He did it once and for all, and, and, and there's no more uh, there's no more uh, sacrifice that has to be done. I am, I am uh, so glad that we don't have to do those things, that he paid it all. Amen. Now, you need to study and look at the ceremonial law because uh, it is important. Uh, and, and the ceremonial law in the Old Testament about how to carry out these things and all, they're beautiful types of, the, of, uh, of Christ in, in, in the Old Testament. Now, let me give you one. This is just one. And, and there's dozens and dozens and dozens. And when I go through the Old Testament, I, sometimes I just about have a fit because I see, man, that's my Savior. That's Jesus. On the Day of Atonement, uh, there was one day a year, they call the Day of Atonement, when, when they would uh, uh, pray for the sin of Israel for that year. And, and it was the one day that the priest, the high priest, got to go 
behind the veil, behind the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God with the sacrifice for the sin of the people of that day. Now, you and I don't have to do that. You know why? Because we are our own high priest, and we can confess our own sins, and we don't have to do it one time a year. You know, we have to do it every day, don't we? <laughs> Amen. And so, we, we, but, but the picture of that, and, and, uh, and, and, and I don't have time to get into all of it, but here's one of the things they did. Do you remember when they, the, the high priest at, at a certain point in the ceremony, he took his hands and there was two goats, they would turn one of them loose, and he would put his hands on the, on the one goat, it was called the what? Scapegoat. It was called the scapegoat. He had put his hands, and, and it was like if ceremonially he was transferring the sin of the people of Israel for that year onto that scapegoat. So they would take that scapegoat and they would take him out into the wilderness and leave the scapegoat and come and, and come back where he'd never come back to the representing sin. He'd never he'd be in the wilderness. Now what they would do, and you get this in in, in studying uh, history and everything, they would uh, while they were taking the scape, scapegoat out, representing the sin of Israel for the for the people of that year, they would they would be there and they would be dead silence in the congregation and they would take several men and they would spread those men out so far apart and 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 I, I'm just just for illustration's sake I'll say a hundred yards may have been longer maybe whatever they just spread people out and they'd take the goat out they'd go out further they'd go out further they'd go out further and they'd go out further and they'd finally get to the deepest part of the wilderness the last man with the scapegoat and he had turned that He'd turn that uh, goat loose in the wilderness. And when he would, when it was done, when it was finished, that scapegoat was in the wilderness. He was away. He would turn around and he would say, back to the, the guy that's down the road, he'd say, it is finished. And that guy would hear that. And he would tell this guy, next guy, it is finished. He would yell it out. And this guy here would, would listen, he'd hear, and he'd and it'd go all the way back to the camp. And when it would get back to the camp, and, 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 and they would, that last guy would go running into the camp with that news, he'd be out of breath, he'd get in there, and he'd say, it's finished. And that place would explode with joy and celebration and praising God that their sins were forgiven. Why? It's finished. <laughs> Guess what happened at Calvary? He bowed his head. And he said, it's finished. And for the first time in the history of mankind, it was official. It was finished. It wasn't would, for a year. It was forever. Amen? Isn't that good? And so... <laughs> You say, what's all I got to do with the Ten Commandments? I don't know. I'm just telling you <laughs> different types of the laws <laughs> and, uh, and everything. So, uh, but, uh, so uh, that's why the, uh, the, those, those Ten Commandments are, are given and everything. And so uh, the, the Ten Commandments are not the plan of salvation. Now, right quick, let's look at the ten, are the Ten Commandments important, uh, number two. And, uh, and the short answer is uh, yes, you know, <laughs> regardless of what uh, some people might say. Now, I, I just listed four things here, uh, the reason the Ten Commandments are important. Number one, the impact that they, uh, that they make. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 34 that righteousness exalts a nation, but a sin is a reproach to any people. So... In right living and looking at the Ten Commandments, because that, that is part of right living, the impact they would make. Now, what it, can, you, can you imagine for a minute what this world would be like? Now, I'm not saying everybody saved, well, but what if everybody lived by the Ten Commandments and, and, and did those? Here's one thing, the impact it would have. Oh, my Lord. Your six o'clock news would go something like this. 
the 6 o'clock news come on and the anchors, you know, they're talking back and forth. How you doing? I'm doing good and everything. And then they, they get into some uh, sports. They say, well, you know, the Braves mess bit up on the Braves again. And, you know, they're telling the sports. And the Falcons, they're getting ready to play. And they're going to be terrible this year. Bulldogs ain't going to. Well, never mind about the Bulldogs. But, <coughs> and so, they, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't help it. Uh, but, uh, and so they do the sports, and then they do the weather, you know, the weather guy gets up or weather girl gets up, and they do the weather, you know, the weather's doing this and everything. And then they say, well, you know, the, the, the road construction down here, traffic's real bad, kids went back to school, you know, and they kind of, you know, go through some stuff and everything. Now, remember, there's been no... There's been no murder, no robbery, uh, no greed, no cussing, no lying. There's nothing to report from Washington, D.C. <laughs> you know, when, could you imagine the, po the politicians not lying for, you know, like a, a, a month or something? You know, that shall not be a big old lie, you know? <laughs> And so, and so they go through the news, you know, they've done all this stuff, the weather and the sports and the, you know, local traffic and all that kind of stuff. And, and all of a sudden they look around at one another and they're like, we ain't got nothing else to report. <laughs> the impact that keeping the Ten Commandments would have on this world. Oh, my goodness. You know, it's, 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 it's mind-boggling to, to just even think about it. And so the impact they would have, the number two, they are from God. I have always, uh, maybe not always, but for years I have wanted a red-letter Old Testament. And I've run that by several, I, you know, some of my Bible college guys and professors and stuff. I can't get anybody to bite on it. I don't have time. But just go through the Old Testament. And every time the Bible says, thus saith the Lord, put it in red letters. Wouldn't that be cool? How about, can, can I get a volunteer to work on that uh, next? Uh, Connie, did you raise your hand or did you scratch it? Oh, that was David Turner. <laughs> David's got his hand up. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Well, I think that would be, the, but they're from God. Listen, listen to this. Over in Exodus where he gives them the first time, uh, Here's what it says in verse 1. And God spake all these words, saying, I'm the Lord thy God. And he just start. He just goes. You know, you need to do this. You don't need to do that. Here's what you. And, and so they're important uh, because they're, they're from Jehovah God. And I said Jehovah God because a lot of people think that somebody else is God. But it's Jehovah God, you know. I mean, that's our God, you know. And then, uh, number three, Christ talked about them there in, in uh, Matthew uh, chapter 5. Uh, and, and I'll say more about this a little bit later. But uh, this is just one place that Christ talked about them, Matthew chapter 5, 17 through 19. Here's what Jesus said about them. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am, come, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And he did. He was, in fact, he was the only one that did. He kept, he kept all, he was, he was perfect. Uh, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth are passed away, not one jot or tittle shall no one wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled, which he did. And then he says, whosoever there shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So God didn't think that we need to get rid of the, uh, Christ didn't think we need to get rid of the uh, uh, the, the the law. It's it's important. And then number four, it is important for us to see them. And I got a little bit convicted about this my, myself. It's important to see them. Now, uh, the Bible said over there in Deuteronomy chapter six, uh, <clears throat> when God was giving them the second time, and He had just given them the second time there in chapter 5. And over in chapter 6, here's what he said. He, here's what he instruct, instructed Israel to do. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. Okay? And thou shalt teach them diligently to thy children. 
and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou right. In other words, you know, the Word of God just needs to be on in, in our conversation, our heart, all the time. You know, just not to say you can't talk about going fishing or whatever, but, you know, usually when I sit down with somebody and start talking a little bit, have a little bit of time to talk with them, it gets to the Word of God somewhere, somewhere along that way. And here's what he said, Thou shalt bind them, thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and uh, shall be frontless. They had the, the uh, place to put the Word of God here, and uh, in, the, in the Word of God here, uh, where they could, uh, uh, you know, it could, could, could be on their mind continuously. And then here's what he says. Thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house, and on thy gate. Now, everybody's probably old enough in here to remember. Y'all remember when you see the Ten Commandments everywhere? You remember when you see the Ten Commandments in school? You see the Ten Commandments in school anymore? Well, God said, you need to put them out there. Now, I'm going to, uh, uh, you see them in, a, in, in, in the courthouse and in different places. I've seen them, I've seen them all over the place. I don't see them much anymore. Listen to this. Uh, in Stone versus Graham in 1980, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that a Kentucky law that required the posting of the Ten Commandments on the wall of every public school classroom in the state violated the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, amendment because the purpose on the uh, display was essentially religious. Now this is y'all remember I sort of remember that in Kentucky in 1980. I'm I'm an old timer. The Kentucky law adopted in 1978 was challenged by a group of parents and children representing different religions. And uh, so the Kentucky law upheld it, and the Supreme Court reversed it and said that not not in Kentucky, and it, it and it went everywhere. And I thought it was interesting. There's a picture here. And you can, you can Google this and see it yourself. After the Supreme Court ruling of Stone versus Graham that invalidated a Kentucky law requiring public school to post the Ten Commandments, state legislatures moved to adopt laws to allow Ten Commandment displays in public spaces under certain circumstances. For the example, Kentucky in 2000 passed a law of ten, putting the Ten Commandments in the public classroom uh, when incorporated into historical display. In this 2000 photo, students from Harlan County, Kentucky. Y'all recognize Harlan County, Kentucky? Yeah, yeah. That's what I hear. Harlan County, Kentucky holds signs about the Ten Commandments to show their support to keep them. I thought that was pretty good, and it shows. I, I, I would like to send that to Terry Burkeen, and they're holding up signs that says the Ten Commandments, keep them in our school, and this is a bunch of young people, and it says Harlan County supports the Ten Commandments and, and so on and so forth, and, and, and it, it was, it's sad that our Supreme Court said no, even though the state law, they wanted to keep the Ten Commandments. So... But you know what? I, I, can I be honest with you? I don't have them posted anywhere at my house. I'm beginning to think I probably do. I, I've, somebody made me a, a thing a while back, and it's it's a, it's a psalm, uh, Psalm 34, I think it is, and it's on a it's nice plaque and everything. We got it up there, and I thought, you know, why don't we, Wanda? Why don't we just get us a nice plaque? Ten Commandments, and put it up beside that, where when people come up to the door and knock on the door, ring the doorbell or something, else, they'll see, there's the Ten Commandments, you know? And, and my, we might could just highlight, thou shalt not steal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, where somebody fixing to break in or something, they'll say, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> that guy... Thou shalt not steal. You know, maybe make them think, you know. I don't know. Maybe keep somebody from breaking in your house and stealing a bunch of stuff. It's not going to hurt anything, is it? I, and, and, and so, you know, maybe, 
You know, I, I know God was onto something there, but he wanted, he wanted his people to, to be aware and know and, 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 and about the, the commandments and everything and teach them to their kids and display them and, and have them out there. And it's sad that in this country, but you know what? We can put one up at our house. And I've seen a lot of them in people's yards, you know, the Ten Commandments. And uh, uh, we might ought to be doing that, you know, uh, before that becomes illegal. They come down to Randy's house and say, hey, you, this Ten Commandments out in your yard, you've got to get rid of it. Randy's like, where's my shotgun? <laughs> No, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. You know, I don't, you don't get the gun out. But anyway, so, so that's the, the number three is why are the commandments given two times in the Bible in the Old Testament? And that's a good question. They're given in, in, uh, in Exodus chapter 20, and then they're given in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Now, there's a lot of scripture there, and a lot of things went on between the first time they were given and the second time they were given, I, I think I had it written down how many pages that was. But anyway, that's, that's a lot of stuff going on. And so why were they given two times? Let me, let me just hit this just a little bit. Now, the children of, of Israel came out of Egypt in Exodus chapter 12, in verse 37 and 38. If I have that on there or not, but... Uh, Exodus chapter, yeah, I do. The Israelites, Israelites leave Egypt in Exodus 12. And uh, listen to what it says. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramez, where they're in Egypt, to Succoth, outside of, uh, uh, over toward the promised land. And it says about 600,000 on foot that were men besides children. Now that was 600,000 men that were able to be in war. And I think, I know the beginning age was 20. They couldn't join the army until they were 20. They were considered a man at 20. I think it went to 40. So that leaves most of us guys, we, we, can't, we can't fight. <laughs> you know. uh, Lee, can you, are you, you can't fight either. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so that was just those. That was just the men. Now that was not the women and the children and the people that went with them. Listen, listen to what the next verse says. And a mixed multitude went up also with them with flocks and herds and uh, very much cattle. A mixed multitude. If you go through your Old Testament and study that, that period in there, you see where that mixed multitude cost them a lot of trouble. They were not Israelites. They were Gentiles that had maybe converted to uh, Judaism or whatever, but they went along with them, but they caused them a lot of trouble. You know what that's a picture of? The mixed multitude. It's a picture of lost people in a church, in a local church. It's a mixed multitude. Randy Pike told me the other day, he said, it don't matter how big or how small the church is, there's a mixed multitude. And so, anyway, <laughs> I better get off that. And, and, and so they, they leave Egypt. They go across the Red Sea. They get hungry. God feeds them. They get thirsty. God gives them something to drink. And about the best I can figure, let's, let's illustrate it like this. That's when they start. That's the first giving. That's the second one. I did that because it would be easier than chairs. I usually use chairs to illustrate everything. And uh, I was afraid they couldn't follow me in the... Back there, but anyway, they, so they start out here. They leave Egypt, and uh, and they go about six months from chapter twelve to, to chapter twenty in Exodus. It's, it's it's about six months, and God gives them the Ten Commandments. He speaks, they hear His voice. Uh, he writes it on the on the tables and gives them to Moses, and uh, and so they they uh, they they get there. They, they go through the rest of the book of Exodus. They go into Leviticus, and God re reveals his holiness in the book of Exodus <coughs> and uh, about how uh, God is a God of purity, and he's a holy God. He sets up laws for them, 
he sets up, he wants Israel to be different than the other nations around there. And then they get to uh, Numbers chapter 14, and verse 8 is one of the most important verses in, in your whole Bible. And I've got it down here. Two, uh, so they, they get six months out, Ten Commandments, and then about two years later, they come to a place called Kadesh Barnea. And guess what they do? They send out 10 spies, 12 spies. They send out 12 spies. 10 of them come back and say they're too big to kill. They're giants over there. Two of them say they're too big to miss. You know, we can't, we can't, miss, can't miss them boys. They're too big. And so they, they listen to the majority. How many of you know that the majority is not always right? The majority is not always right. God is always right, but the majority is not always right. And so instead of being, when they started out and, and they come up to, to the, actually Kadesh Barnea is a crossroads. They got to make up their mind. They're going to trust God and go into the promised land right then or they're not. And they chose not. So guess what? From here, from that two years to right here, it's 38 more years, which is a total of 40 years, they wander in the wilderness. They didn't have to. It wasn't necessary, but they did. And I'm going to tell you something. When you get to a point, or I get to a point in my life, where we don't trust God, we're going to do some wandering in the wilderness and waste some time and waste our time and some of God's time and everybody else's time. Don't wander in the wilderness. Joshua and Caleb, and, 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 and Joshua and Caleb are trying to convince them that we can go over and possess the land, and verse 8 says it's one of the greatest statements in, in all the Word of God, and you're talking about preaching. Here's what, he's, here's what uh, Joshua says. If the Lord delight in, the, in us, then he will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land floweth with milk and honey. If the Lord delight in us, and all they had to say, was yes, we'll go. Let's go get them. They are too big to miss. If the Lord, Concord Baptist Church, you want to do great things for God? Sure you do. You want to be a light in this community? You want to get things done? You want to have people saved? You want, you want to go forward? I can tell you how to do it. If the Lord delight in us, then it'll take place. That's a s different sermon for a different day. <laughs> but the Lord, if, if he just delights in us, and, and Caleb tried to talk them into it, and they wouldn't do it. So they went, they wandered for 38 years in the wilderness, two years already out, a total of 40 years, and then God gives them the law the second time. He gave them the law here in, uh, in Exodus, and then in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And so uh, a lot went on there, and, and, and people died in the wilderness. Uh, the the young, young people over here uh, were, uh, you know, adults by now, and, and, and they were over here. But this old crowd, the only two that made it over was Joshua and Caleb. They made it into the promised land as old men. And uh, the rest of them died in the wilderness. All right, if, if uh, I, I don't know, we don't know the exact number, but if they started out with 3 million people, Don, could you imagine how many funerals they had in 38 years? A bunch of them. I mean, it's, that's astronomical. But, and I wish I had time to deal with it, I, I don't. Do, do you know what a miracle that is, that they wandered for 38 years in the wilderness? Now, their clothes didn't wear out. You know, the, the clothes didn't wear out. Uh, the shoes didn't wear out. But there was a lot of meals and there was a lot of moving. Can you imagine the logistics of three million people? I, I, I think that they, that they moved, if I got it figured out, they, I think they averaged once a year. I think they moved about 40 times, set up camp. They'd set up camp here, be there for a while. God had say, move. The pillar of fire 
at night, you know, in, in, in the cloud by day. And God would say, okay, y'all been here long enough? Let's, let's go down here, you know. And they would, they would go. When they would march, when they would go together as a unit, they had uh, the, the tabernacle was in the center. There was three tribes here. There was some tribes out here. And, and, if, and if you looked at it from a, above and looked at just three million people moving, it looked like a giant cross going from one place to the other, you know. And, uh, and, and so they, would, they, would, they, they did that and everything, and they get over here, and God, with, with uh, Moses, gives them the book of Deuteronomy. And the book of Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy means uh, the second law. Deutero is like a, a duet, you know, two people, duet. Like me and a guy sing a song, it'd be a duet, wouldn't it? It'd be a mess, wouldn't it? <laughs> and, uh, and so it's the second law. Now, when he gives the, the Ten Commandments over here and, and, and all these laws, they're sort of a, it's, it's sort of a mystery how long the, the book of Deuteronomy takes. If you look at the date of, of when it starts and when Joshua goes over into the Promised Land, it's the same date. So the book of Deuteronomy is quick. Some say it was real quick, but it didn't take long. And he, he gave them some, uh, some laws and things that they needed. And, and the, uh, some people say that, that uh, you know, well, God uh, gave them some laws over here and different laws over here. There's a reason for that. Let me, let me just give you one. There's a thing in, in, in the book of Deuteronomy where he talks about uh, guardrails. Yeah, guardrails. Like uh, up on a roof on a house and have a, you know, where you go up there. and, and uh, How many of you have a porch that's up kind of high or whatever, and you got some guardrails around to keep people, you know, from falling? It's just... Well, God told them to, in, in Deuteronomy to do it. It's called a battlement for their safety. Well, listen, back here when they were living in tents, they didn't need that information. <laughs> you know what? They didn't need any guardrails. They were down on the ground. So God, he does that through there. You need to do this. You need to do that. You're coming into the land. You're occupying these houses. You're going to, uh, I'm going to be with you. you know, I give you that land. It's flowing with milk and honey. And, and so God, God did that and, and, and gave. And he actually, and, and we'll see where there's a little, he, he sort of added a little bit over here in these ten, even in these Ten Commandments. They're, they're, they're a little different than they are in Exodus and Deuteronomy. You know, there's no conflict, you know, he just, he, uh, but because of the time span and everything, he, he, uh, I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait to show y'all some of this stuff. It's just, it's exciting. And so, uh, right quickly, uh, uh, they go over in, uh, in, in Joshua 4 and, uh, 18 through 22 and, and, uh, they, they, they come out and they put these stones up and they said, what do these stones mean? And, and uh, he, he said to, to, to let your children know that Israel came over on Jordan on dry ground. So they, they, they go into the promised land. Now, number four, uh, what did Jesus say about them? Well, uh, in Matthew 22, 36 to 40, the uh, rich young ruler came up to him, trying to entrap him, and he said, uh, which is the great commandment? Uh, and, uh, and Jesus, he, he quoted exactly what they believed and taught in that day. And uh, Matthew chapter uh, <clears throat> 20, where is that? 26? Where is that? Oh, yeah, 22. 2236 through 40. And, uh, and and Jesus talked to him and uh, he said, uh, Master, what is the great commandment? Trying to trip him up and uh, mess him up or whatever, like they did in those days. Jesus quoted their 
their own uh, commandment they had. He said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. And the first, this is the first and great commandment, and the second is likened to it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, if you took off 613 of these laws that they had and just held them up right there in the middle, on these two held all of them. And that was to love the Lord our God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and love your neighbor as yourself. Now there's two ways to look at that, and I'm done. You could look at it like uh, uh, that those first four commandments are our relationship with God, and those next six commandments are our relationship with each other, with a, with a fellow people. Or you could look at it like uh, that first commandment is, is the first commandment that's given in Exodus and Deuteronomy, and the, uh, the second commandment, is, is given pretty much verbatim in the book of Leviticus. And uh, over in, in the book of Leviticus, uh, he says, Thou shalt not avenge or bear a grudge against any of the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. So there it is, right there. And on those two hang all those 613, 365 positive and uh, 248 negative. If that rabbi is right that I read after. <laughs> I have not had the time or the inclination to go through and I, I've got a list of the 613. But to go out and figure out which one's positive and which one's negative. Uh, I'm going to have whoever's working on a red letter edition. When you get through with that, you can work on that one. <laughs> you, can, you can work on that one. But anyway, all right, one more and we're done. Why did, uh, what did Jesus say about it? And then number five, can we keep them? Can we keep? Short answer is no. <clears throat> but Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Amen. You can't do it. You can't keep them. I can't keep them. But through Christ, we can. Isn't that great? Now that's a brief brief introduction to the Ten Commandments. So I'll have to go through and count, see how many nights we're going to be here. These guys have got money on that I can't finish these ten in our little Bible study this fall. They, Las Vegas has got odds and the whole deal, you know. And uh, I'm going to prove them all wrong. I'm gonna, we're going we're gonna to get all ten. I'm pretty sure of it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we might have to get two in one night or something. You, you never know. But does, uh, listen, does anybody have any questions? Do, do, you, do you see why I really did that tonight? I, I think it gives us a good little more overall view of what the, you know, they're giving over here. Why, why are they giving twice and, and, and all these things? And what did Christ say about them? And, and, and I didn't get into it real deep, but uh, I just wanted to, and I like to do that. I like, if I'm doing a series, sometimes you'll notice I'll do an introduction. And I hope you enjoyed it tonight. I hope you come back. I want to take this time and thank you for watching and worshiping with us today. My name is Joey Dedman. I'm with Concord Missionary Baptist Church. If you are not a follower of Jesus Christ and have never asked him to come into your heart, I'd like to take a few moments to help you do just that. You know, the Bible tells us in Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You know, this is open to every one of us that requests because Romans 10, 13 goes on to say even deeper, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So today, if you would like to pray with me, let's bow our heads in prayer to our Lord and Savior and ask him if you're seeking him to come into your heart today. Lord, I just want to take the opportunity that if there's someone out there today, and dear God, Lord, they're seeking you, dear God, Lord, and maybe they're at a place in their life where they can't see, but today through the Holy Spirit, which has pricked their heart through your word, not the words that I preach, 
but through the holy word of an awesome father. God, I pray today, dear God, Lord, that they would be enlightened. And God, I, I'd ask them today to pray with me and say, Lord, I want to be a believer. Dear God, Lord, I want to believe in the fact that I know that you walked on this earth. Lord, I want to know that you died for my sins. God, I want to believe in the fact that on the third day you resurrected from a tomb and you sit on the right hand of God. And today, Lord, I want to ask you to come into my heart. And Lord, if there's one out there praying with us today, dear God, Lord, that's seeking you, Lord, I pray that they would say this prayer with me today, dear God, Lord, and invite Jesus Christ into their heart to forgive their sins. Lord, we thank you for your blessings upon us. God, we thank you for what you're doing for us. I just pray that you'd be with us through this moment in time. And dear God, Lord, and show us the things that you'd have us to see. In Christ's name we pray, Lord. Amen. You know, if you've done that today, if you've taken the opportunity to ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart, you know, he died on a cross close to 2,000 years ago and he walked on the earth. The Bible teaches us that everyone that calls upon the name of the Lord and believes in their heart that he has risen from the grave shall be saved. So if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior today, you know, I want to invite you to, you know what, into your new relationship with your Father. And I want to, to maybe help you, maybe through watching the videos as you learn and you grow, but maybe try to find a, a church that's close to you, a church home where you can go with other believers and walk with them and learn to grow with them. I invite you today also that maybe if today you've asked Christ to come into your heart, that, that you know what, maybe you would let us know. And drop us a postcard to say, you know, hey, I listen to these videos on YouTube. I appreciate what you've done. But I would like for y'all to know that on this date, on so-and-so, that I asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart. We'd invite you, and, and if you look at the address that's on the screen today, and, and maybe send a postcard. And then, you know what, if you don't want to write it down, maybe through email. There will be a, an email address that you can address to our church at Concord Missionary Baptist Church. And you could just email us and let us know what's going on in your life. But even better than that out there today, maybe you are a, a Christian today and maybe you're not here in Temple, Georgia with us, but you're in your walk with Jesus today and you're, you're having some valleys that you're having to go through. And, and maybe you need some, to seek some prayer requests and some other shoulders to lean on. I invite you to also to email us or drop us a card. We meet on Wednesday nights to pray. We take these things before the Father. We take these things very seriously. and We come together as a group as we pray to our Father. So I'd invite you to, to send those prayer requests to us, and I promise you that we'll take them and put them on the altar and bring them before the Lord. Once again, I want to thank so much for you taking your time to come spend with us and worship with us, you know, through song, through word, but more, more than anything else, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May God bless you and your family.